We turn now to 1 Peter, chapter 5, and verse 8. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him firm in your faith. In the New Testament, we are clearly exhorted that we are not to be afraid of Satan. Fear not is the word of Jesus to us. We are not to fear demons or men or anything. If you fear God, you need fear nothing else, as we saw in an earlier study. The picture the New Testament paints is not of the Christian running for his life and somehow escaping from the devil's grasp, but rather of the devil running because the Christian stands firm and resists him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In James 4.7 we are told, Submit yourself to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. Not that you will flee and escape from his grasp, but that he will flee from you. Now this is a truth which the devil seeks to hide from most Christians. Most Christians are so scared of demons because the devil has hidden the truth from them that Jesus has conquered Satan and all the forces of hell at the cross and through his resurrection. And if we are united to Jesus, our head, then his victory is our victory too. And it is the devil who is to flee from us. But the first step to that is what it says in James 4, 7, submit to God first and then resist the devil. If we try to resist the devil without submitting to God, then of course we cannot overcome him. If we submit to God, then we shall certainly overcome him. In the name of Jesus, he will flee. The same thing we see here in 1 Peter 5. First of all, we are told in verse 6, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Then what happens? God pours out his grace in abundance upon us. And he will exalt us at the proper time, it says in verse 6. To be exalted is to be exalted by grace. It's no use our exalting ourselves. That would be sin. That would be to give in to the devil. When we are puffed up, we open ourselves to the devil because the devil became the devil through pride, as we read in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. And when we exalt ourselves, then we are doing exactly what Satan did to lift himself up. But no, it says in 1 Peter 5, 6, let God exalt you. He will do it at the right time. He knows when we can bear it and how much we can bear and he will exalt us by giving us grace to stand up so that we can resist Satan. We must leave it to God to lift us up and never seek to lift ourselves up by our own desires because that is how so many fall a prey to Satan's attacks. Satan can have no place in us and no power over us if we continuously humble ourselves before God and humble ourselves to serve one another. And this is the context in which he goes on to say about being of a sober spirit Verse 8, and on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. The devil comes like a lion, or he comes like a serpent, as we read in Genesis 3 and Revelation chapter 12. But we are to overcome him both when he comes in his subtlety as a serpent and when he comes to trying, trying to frighten us as a lion. His characteristic is pride. And if we have nothing of that in us, we can overcome him. We cannot overcome him if the pride that characterizes Satan is found in some small measure in our own heart as well. And this is why we need to judge ourselves of all pride of every sort and cleanse ourselves from every type of pride and humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. Then we can resist Satan. He will not be able to devour us, but we shall make him to flee. He prowls about looking for some Christian who's puffed up a little bit here, or puffed up a little bit there so that he can swallow him up. But if we humble ourselves consistently, we can resist Satan firm in the faith. The same experiences of suffering, it says in verse 9, are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. All Christians around the world face suffering of some sort or the other, some to a greater intensity, some lesser. But suffering is the portion of all those who will live a godly life in Christ Jesus. And that's an encouragement to us. We are not in this battle alone. Let's humble ourselves. And it says here, after you've suffered for a little while, verse 10, 
the God of all grace, the one who is continuously giving you grace, this God who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, who has allowed all this suffering for your very best, who has allowed the devil to prowl about, will perfect you, confirm you, strengthen you and establish you. In other words, make you much stronger than you ever were before at the end of all this suffering. Because he has power over all things. It says in verse 11, God has got power over all things. He's got power over Satan too. Why is it he doesn't destroy Satan then? Because he wants to fulfill a purpose in our life through Satan, through Satan tempting us. God fulfills his purposes in our life. Through temptation, we partake of God's glory. And God's power is such that he can make all these things work together for our good. And he's called here the God of all grace, verse 10. Grace sufficient for every need. Every trial and every temptation is available with him and offered to us on one condition, that we humble ourselves. Then he will exalt us by grace and make us stand and resist Satan and Satan will never find a place in any of us. And then in conclusion, Peter says in verses 12 to 14, Through Silvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him. Silvanus is the same as Silas, and it is through him that Peter wrote this letter. And Peter says, I consider Silvanus a faithful brother. And this is the greatest testimony that any one of us can have. Not a clever brother, or a smart one, or a capable one, or an intelligent one, or a gifted one. All these things have their place. But the greatest testimony of all is a faithful brother, faithful in the little things, that God has committed to us. He says, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. In other words, all that we have studied through in this study in 1 Peter is an explanation of the true grace of God. The true grace of God involves suffering. That's one thing we have seen clearly in this letter of Peter. The true grace of God we have seen in 1 Peter 2, verse 21 and 22, involves following in the footsteps of Christ, committing no sin. Chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, suffering in the flesh as Christ did and seizing from sin. The true grace of God involves servants submitting to their masters. Chapter 2, wives submitting to their husbands. Chapter 3, younger submitting to the elder. Chapter 5, and all of us being clothed with humility, and all the many wonderful exhortations, judging ourselves, the last verses of 1 Peter 4. This is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. And so, it's good for us to read through this letter once again, and see it all as an exposition of the true grace of God and how we can receive it. He explains this grace of God in all the chapters, right up to the middle of chapter 5, and then he tells us in the middle of chapter 5 how we can receive this grace by humbling ourselves. And then sin need never have dominion over us. And he says, stand firm in it, for there is a false grace that people preach and have experienced, which means just forgiveness of sins and you can live as you like. But Peter says, no, we are to cease from sin and follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Stand firm in this grace so that no one can shake you from it. And a closing greeting, verse 13, it says, She who is in Babylon, that is perhaps the church which was in Rome. Babylon was a nickname given to Rome by the early Christians. Chosen together with you, there God had his church, sends you greeting. And so does my son Mark. John Mark was the one who initially fell away because he couldn't stand the rigors of Paul's apostolic journeys, but finally repented and Peter encouraged him, and now he was a blessing, both to Peter and to Paul. He sends his greetings too. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace be to you all who are in Christ. And so here is a letter that has explained to us what the true grace of God is, and it is a word that we need especially in the days in which we live, where many have turned the grace of God into an excuse for sin. Let's heed that exhortation then from Peter 
in 1 Peter 5.12, stand firm in this true grace of God.